I'm Cray Beaumont Flynn. Welcome to Beyond the Design, a show that gives you a peek behind the curtain of the design industry and shares the stories of those that are the driving force behind it. Well, welcome to Beyond the Design today. We have landscape designer Juan Boy Ippolito. Did I say that correct? Yes, you did. Good. First try. <laughs> Well, let's just jump right into it and tell us a little about your story and how you got interested in the field of landscape design. Well, I was born in East Africa, and thank you so much for having me. I was born in East Africa and spent a lot of time outside. I'm that era of kids that just basically lived outside. And my family has a farm in the Rift Valley, so a lot of my time was spent in the Great Rift Valley. So I was very, you know, I was very used to wide open spaces. Um, of course, I went to college, you know, um, went into a completely different career. And then right around um, maybe 10 years ago, I really started to think about what it is I really want to do. And I'd always gardened because my my mom was a wonderful gardener and still is a wonderful gardener and aunts and grandma and all those people. So I decided to go back to school and um, get into it um, in a professional way. And uh, so I did. And and it's been a really great change. It was a wonderful um, shift right at the time I needed to do it. I trusted my instincts and here I am. And it's paid off. It's paid off really well. <laughs> oh, that's good. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of difference between Manhattan and East Africa and not that many <laughs> wide open spaces, well, unless you would go out into the country. So how do you... Mm-hmm. How do you vision when you look at at a new project? How do you vision it? How do you incorporate uh, the landscape and your thoughts into creating an environment? Well, I'm very lucky that I started initially working in upstate New York, so like the Westchester area. So a lot of the properties that I worked on were very huge properties. So, you know, I was able to spend time in big landscapes and start to really um, find my eye in, in the large American space. Mm-hmm. And then as I started to work in more and more close to the city, I was concentrated in Long Island where people still have space, but it's slightly smaller. Right. And then those clients that I had in Long Island usually had spaces, you know, like a penthouse or something in the city. So I was able to work in all three spaces, you know, all three three landscapes in the New York and and metropolitan, you know, tri-state area. So my eye was developed very much as a child, seeing those wide landscapes. And then when I started working here, it was again in bigger landscapes in Westchester. And then it was kind of like, you know, moving down to Mm -hmm. the penthouse style. So, you know, I'm, I'm very able to adapt quickly to, you know, any kind of space. So do you do a lot of um, outdoor spaces in the city? I used to. um, Mm -hmm. trying now to shift to more commercial work. So working with botanical gardens, I'm doing a garden in Richmond, Virginia for the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden. And that's a two year process. And then I have a project that's just about to start being conceptualized in Sierra Leone in uh, West Africa. And then I have another one that's coming up next year in Kenya. So I'm moving into the types of of, of um, projects that are, are more like multi-year projects. So I'm able to really spend time on them and, and hone in and, and have as much design freedom, you know, and these are projects that will last unlike many of my former clients who would sell their homes and the garden right. would disappear, you know. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's I'm restart. <laughs> to, exactly. I'm trying to really rethink how I work in, in, in landscape design. So does the commercial space give you more freedom to be more creative and uh, create more of a transitional spaces where a residential is about someone's own particular lifestyle and how they use that outdoor space? Yes. The commercial clients trust me and they feel like I really bring knowledge to the table. And as did my, you know, my, my homeowners Mm -hmm. as well, the homeowners want what they want. 
right. you know, the commercial, <laughs> the commercial client is, it wants to, to, to see your ideas, you know, so, so I'm able to really come up with different ideas, you know, uh, uh, you know, different designs. And mm. then we sit down and, you know, figure out what works best for the space. Whereas a homeowner, you know, they saw something in a magazine or they saw something in their friend's house or they saw something in a garden in Europe they visited and they want right. that. They want that particular thing. Yeah, they want that. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't waver from that. That's it. No. That's what I want. Yeah. So then, then, then in that kind of work, it really becomes about you just installing what they want mm-hmm. as opposed to me using my, my, my brain. You know. So far on the commercial side, is it more about experiential environments that you're creating for a mass audience because you don't yes. know that individual? Yes. And of course, it's about the bottom line. Mm-hmm. So when designing, for instance, for, you know, the Lewis Ginta Botanical Garden, number one is I have to think about the bottom line. They need to bring people into the garden and they need to bring paying people into the garden. Mm-hmm. So that's bottom line. You have to be able to create something that will bring people in time and again. Yes. And bottom line also also means social media in this time. So you need to create a space where people want to be photographed, right? They want to have these backdrops. They want to be photographed in these spaces. And who does that more than anyone? It's young girls, women, (laughs) you know, young women, young girls. So you start to think like that in terms of, and 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 older you know older women who come for you know mother's day or you know they they come because they want to you know find new plants to grow in their gardens so approaching commercial spaces bottom line visibility social media that's what that's that's really what drives uh, those designs yeah. so what is your process when you get a new project on the commercial space what is your Processed in creating and envisioning the end product? Well, I mean, the first thing always is um, looking at the site, you know, what, how the site looks, where the sun sets, where the sun rises, how hot is it, you know, what zone is it, what plants are going to work here, you know, and then talking to the, to the leadership, you know, the, the, the leadership at the site, mm-hmm. what are they looking for? And like I said, bottom line is number one. You know, we need people to come in here. So I look at all that and then I think about how I would feel because I really trust myself. I know myself and I and I am very lucky that I have been able to visit many different gardens in many different countries. So I know how to design for a type of clientele. So I trust myself. How would I feel? What do I want to see? What would I like to see if I came here? What do they have? And what doesn't work that they already have and Mm -hmm. how, if it's working, how can we make it, you know, put some icing on that, you know, and make it even, you know, glossier in this new space. So those are the things I think about Um, accessibility. Also, it's got to be very different from anything else in the, in that part of the world or in that town, you know, in that city, it has to be a draw. It has Mm -hmm. to have something that people can't find any place else. It's almost like booking a banquet room if you're having a wedding. You know, you want the one that has what all the others don't. They, right. You don't want chicken or fish. You want yeah. <laughs> you, know, you want you want something. You want shrimp. You know, right? So you gotta you gotta give them something that doesn't exist already, but so, in a way that that they're comfortable with. They're comfortable, and you, it's a focal point, I guess you could say, that exactly. really draws them in into. Mm-hmm. An environment. Now, when you're creating these spaces, is there something that you relate back to that actually inspired you or motivated you to envision these spaces? Well, I like a sense of freedom. I don't particularly like the idea of being corralled, you know, in a space and being unable to wander through the space. So I like it when people feel like they can walk around and there's little nooks and crannies that they can discover. And I also like it when it feels very high end Mm -hmm. because people want to feel like they're in something really high end, especially if you're a girl taking pictures, you know, for your social media, you know, a a woman who wants to have, you know, a wedding or, or you you want your women's garden group, you know, it has to feel high end. It has to feel luxurious. 
So those are the things that I try and put in a space. And you can do that very easily um, by choosing the type of hardscape you use, you know, the type of um, planters, if you have them, the type of planting, the type of plants you choose, you know, you can make up space really nice. So those are the things that I go for when I'm designing. Are you more a flowery person or herbal trees? Oh, I'm very flowery. I love, I love a pretty flower. Um, I love, and it's funny because I have, I have this idea about certain types of plants. Like I have flowers that I think are very classy and luxurious. And then there's those that I feel are kind of like run of the mill and the same thing (laughs) with trees, you know? So it's really weird, but in my head, it it all like makes sense. And it's funny because when I, when I, in other gardens that I've done before, it translates because clients will usually say, oh, this looks really nice. This looks really high end. I had somebody say, um, I was I was being interviewed for a magazine article and I showed uh, the interviewer these pictures of a garden that I was working on at the time. And she says, oh, my God, this feels very haute couture. And I was like, exactly. You get it. <laughs> so. So, yeah, I, I, I have my way around. Um, is there a, and I, I, and like I said, I love I'm a flower girl. I love yeah. Yeah. So is there a particular flower or plant that you install in all your projects that's part of your signature no no No? not at all no i always approach it as something new and fresh and then you know in this industry you're always learning you're constantly learning you're constantly finding some new plants you didn't know about or new combinations you never thought about Mm -hmm. you know and i go out to see gardens i like to go out into nature nature is the biggest teacher by the way um just seeing how nature orders a landscape can really help you. So no, there there is no one plant that I use or one tree that I use. I'm just open to anything because you you find inspiration in anything. You know, right. you could, I could go buy a dress and there's a print on a dress and I like the colors and you know I think oh well what what plants have those colors and how do they work together? You know things like that. So so when you started this journey and becoming a landscape designer, is there anything that's happened? during your career that you're really surprised that you didn't know beforehand? Um, I think that's a hard one. <laughs> um, something that I didn't know that I'm surprised I know now. Was that the question? Correct. Correct. Um, I think what surprised me was that I really know my work, you know, a lot of times when you come into something that's established and there are people who are very established in it, you tend to feel like an imposter. But then I lean back very much into who I am and where I come from and what I come from, the people that I come from. And I realize that I know this work, you know, and I trust myself. So so nothing really surprises me, um, I think. And, and I'm also very humble about it. You know, I ask questions. Mm-hmm. I I I don't know everything. In fact, I don't know anything. You know, if if I keep my mind a clean slate, I'm always learning something new. And so everything is a new discovery, not a new surprise. It's always, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's a, always a discovery. Is there a particular project that you can think of that challenged you, and how you resolved that challenge and created something extraordinary? Um. Yes, this project that I'm doing in Richmond, um, it's a very big space. It's clearly a very commercial space. And one of the ways to be able to eat up space is to use as much big stuff as you can. But I found myself consistently going, choosing very small plants, you know, or, you know, small pot sizes. Mm -hmm. And... And it worked really well when I did the final presentation, my design, because they really got it, you know, mm-hmm. they got what I was trying to do. They got what I was trying to do with the air and the light and the types of plants that I chose. So, so that, that worked very well for me. Does landscape design have trends? And if they do, oh, yeah, definitely. what are some of the trends that you've seen come and go? Well, the, the whole native plant movement, um, 
which in itself is really wonderful. Um, you know, the, the, the Pete Udolf style of gardening, you know, it, it usually starts somewhere in Europe, right? you know, and then it works its way here and then it becomes the thing, you know, <laughs> or, or somebody gives a lecture and then people, you know, oh, that lecture was really great. And then all, all those ideas become part of, you know, other people's work. So it's all, it's it, like fashion. It's, a, it's, it's very trendy, you know? Mm-hmm. So maybe, maybe one day I'll do a garden full of rocks, just all rocks. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the garden of rocks. <laughs> so tell us a little about the projects that you have in Africa going on Sierra Leone and elsewhere. So the one in the, the one in Sierra Leone, I just got to about two, three months ago. Yeah. Um, it is, there's a, a, a he works in the movie industry uh, in Hollywood, the, the, the person who's in mm-hmm. charge of this. And he bought some land in Sierra Leone that he, after visiting, I think maybe he was working there. Yeah, he was actually making a documentary in Sierra Leone and he saw these children and they needed a place to play and a place to stay and a place to go to school. So he bought some land and he decided to turn this into, um, you know, a place you know, with parks, with with a school, with a library, you know, with a soccer field for these children. Wonderful. So he had me come on to help him um, design, you know, the landscape <coughs> for this area in, uh, in in Sierra Leone, in in eastern Sierra Leone, the eastern part of Sierra Leone. Mm-hmm. So this is very recent. We basically just have agreed to this, and and you know, I've I've drawn up some some rough plans already i did some rough um card drawings with my ideas and he loved them and so this is a go now so so there's that and then the one in kenya is going to be a completely uh, native planting um for a a a new home that uh, this person has built so this is also uh, up in the rift valley right near where i i spent a lot of time so I'm pretty excited about that. Those two, okay. I'm very excited about. Fantastic. And what's the time frame for those? Uh, Sierra Leone, I think I will be visiting in early spring. Uh, the Kenya one, I go and start in December. Oh, wonderful. Well, it won't be cold, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, no, it'll be very hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in Kenya, yes. So can you talk about a project that has a strong cultural or historical influence on you? That you've taken your upbringing and kind of installed oh, some of the environment well, back into it. Oh well, here no. I no. mean, because even the plant palette is so different here in in North America. But this one in Kenya that I'm gonna do is basically it, it it's it's everything that I felt growing up as a child that freedom and all those plants. But there that is going to be concentrated in this one space. That also happens to be in this landscape. Right, right. So, so that one I'm very excited about. I'm always thinking about it. I'm always researching, you know, plants that I didn't know that are native there. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm thinking of all the trips that I'm going to make when I'm there, you know, looking for new plants, you know. So that one is very exciting for me. So what, what motivates you as a creative and inspires you as a creative? Well, I know that what I do best and what I am here to do is inspire people to have what I call nature consciousness, to really see nature as as home Mm. and to see themselves as being part of a landscape. The one thing that really threw me for a loop when I really started um, understanding ornamental landscape design here in the West was how it's all about, at least for me, it appeared to be that what people were doing was organizing the landscape to fit their view of how it should look, right. you know. And in that sense, plants aren't even considered as being living things with a lifespan that are part of these wonderful old ecologies, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so my goal is to shift people's consciousness and to make them see themselves as being part of a landscape, part of the landscape, mm-hmm. and and to promote life, to promote nature, 
to see nature as something that outlives us and outlasts us because we just die into it as as part of nature right. and 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 if i can do that then i will have succeeded so i'm not so worried about being you know this famous landscape designer or you know it's about how to shift people's thinking to see themselves as part of this 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 world i mean that's how i came up i i was part of a landscape right i and and i knew that i knew that i was just a part of this landscape and that if i fell apart the landscape would continue you know? have you gotten feedback that people are starting to understand your designs and how they're incorporated and what they should be feeling yes now that i shifted into doing a different kind of work mm -hmm. like i said they get it they're beginning to get it i mean the homeowners like i said they want what they want right right you know? <laughs> and and you know they'll 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 take some of your ideas you know and and you know they pay bills you know and 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 thank you to them that have been able to work um the people that I'm working with more and more now on that bigger scale really get what I'm trying to do. And also it's about aligning yourself with people who have shared values. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when you, Many of us, when we first start out, especially if we're working for ourselves in whatever industry, all you're trying to do is pay the bills, you know. So you'll take anything to pay the bills in the beginning. And hopefully you mature and start to ask yourself, well, why am I here? Why am I doing this work? You know, what is the purpose behind this work or, you know, for what is the intention, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm very lucky because my intention was always very clear. Even at the very beginning when I was in school, I knew that it was about being part of this landscape. I knew that it was about nature consciousness. For me, it was also about understanding what I thought was a little askew in the way that the, the work was being done here. And... Um, you know, and and as I have moved on, I have aligned myself with people who have that same mindset. So it's easy, you know. It's it's it, it gets easier because I know that you know next year I'll be thinking something different because I will have aligned myself with people who are taking me higher in my in my thinking and my love of nature mm -hmm. and love for nature. So I'm assuming a lot of collaboration happens on your part, being a a designer and incorporating your vision and working with the various entities. Yes. Um, in this, in this uh, design that I was doing for the Richmond, um, in Richmond, I'm working with, uh, with a big architecture firm there called Three North. And when I, th and they had come up with their design. And then when I gave them my design, that, you know, they immediately accepted the design. You know, they thought, Oh wow! And you know there were things in it that that they hadn't thought about. You know, she's brilliant. <laughs> I don't know about that, but <laughs> but um, you know, so so they they took that design and and you know we tweaked it and you know reworked it and and it was just a great feeling to know that that they get it, right? You know? They get it and so, love it. Yeah. So I'm sure you work with. Uh artists and installations as well incorporated into oh, some yeah. of your designs yeah so yeah do you have that vision or do you let the artists kind of incorporate what they see in trying to interpret well really i work with two people uh mostly uh one who does all like you know like if i need to to i have one guy for metal work uh, mm -hmm. i use a lot of metal in the in the garden and then I have another guy who does um, all my pottery or, you know, especially if it's for commercial um, and, and I need it a certain way, like if I'm designing it a certain way or if I needed to mimic something that's, you know, that's that I can't find on the market. Right. You know, or if, it, if, I, if he's mimicking really pricey antiques. So I'll usually say, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? You know how do because they know what they're doing. Right. They're the masters in their craft, and then you know we'll work together and make that. And I'm very lucky that so far so good. I've been very lucky with finding the right people, you know, who really get my vision and whose vision I get. You know, um, I think for me the what really helped me was to understand how artists think because I think I am an artist too. You know, and. Um, understanding that it is a very fluid world it is right. um it's a world that changes every five minutes based on how 
what's available, how people feel, um, what they think, you, you know? So understanding how artists think and being one myself, having accepted that I am one, <laughs> makes it very easy now to collaborate with people. And, and then also knowing when to say yes and when to say no, you know, and when to allow other people you know, to, to flourish. I was talking to my husband, my husband, uh, uh, he writes uh, music and I was telling him, you know, sometimes he has these collaborations with people and he's like, well, this person just doesn't get it. And I'm like, you know, sometimes they don't have to get you because they've given you their best. So you just kind of lean back and just appreciate their best. Right. You know what I mean? Even if you don't get it, that's their best, you know? Does that it, makes sense. Make sense. Yeah, it does make sense. To me, it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and it makes other people feel good too. You know? Right, right. Because you remove yourself from, from being the head critic, you know, who gets the final say. We're all just creating. You know? Correct. One way yeah. or another, we all are. Yep. Yeah. So is there a project that you've completed thus far that you can say, wow, I overachieved my own expectations? Well, yeah, I did uh, a garden and it was so weird how that came about. I did a garden for the Philadelphia Flower Show in 2021 that won the Best in Show Award. I was not even thinking I would get, you know, I was, you know, I was just in it to be in right. it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I had a very clear intention, like I said, and and I knew what I was going to do and I did it. And it won and I was very happy and very thankful that people i was i was thankful that people got what i was trying to say and it, with that garden mm -hmm. and it's i mean i'm i'm not i'm no picasso but i think that if you know when picasso was painting he wa he wanted to convey something there was a feeling that he wanted to convey and i feel he i think he was very proud when he saw people you know in awe of his work because then he knew that he had achieved what he was, you know, response, trying to, right. yeah, yeah. So, so it's the same thing. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like the Rolling Stones when they come up with a song and everybody's, you know, everybody, all the, his, their fans uh, love the song. They feel good, you know, so. So when you start creating a garden, do you think about the senses and what senses is primary to use it? The vision or the scent um, or the, the experience? Feeling. It's, it's a feeling, the feeling of peace, you know, you have to be able to just go and have peace. You know, I did a garden um, last year or the year before that, like, I did a show garden for, for, for something that a lot of people didn't, well, the judges didn't understand. And that's fine. But a lot of people wrote to me and said, oh, my God, I sat in your garden and I just didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave, wow. you know, because because they got what I was doing, you know. So like they got what I was doing. Right. And that was a very humbling experience for me because I realized that <coughs> that it, that when you are really in intention, sometimes a hundred thousand people will get it, and sometimes only five hundred will get it. Right. But they got the intention, you know. So intention is like, it's like this fleeting, like, thing, <laughs> you know, that some people get, you know, 500 people get, yeah. or, 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 you know, or it's on Oprah level, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 500 is better than zero, you know? You got to exactly. go with what you get. You get. Mm -hmm. Is there a type of project that you can think of that you haven't been asked or you want to achieve and complete? I would like to design more for teenagers. There's a project that I have in my head that, my God, if I could just do this, I know that everybody, every teenager in America would come to that garden because it is geared solely for teenagers. And I know they would love it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say what it is because I don't <laughs> want somebody to steal my idea, but it's such a fantastic idea. And, and, I, and, I, and I really want to do it. And I may be able to do it here. I think the best place to do it would be Japan because they would really get it. Right. But um, but yeah, there's one that I really want to do. Is there any type of 
garden project you kind of avoid, like desert landscape or herbal um, gardens, or you'll do it all. You like it all. I'll do it all. I mean, it's, yeah. it's oh, oh, you know what? I know what I wouldn't do. Um, anything with a lot of roses, because I'm just, oh, no, or azaleas, rhododendrons, <laughs> you know, but, you know, like if an azalea lover is like, oh, I want 20,000 azaleas in my 190 acre, <laughs> you know, site. No, I'm not going to do that. So, but, you know, I'll, I'll do, I'll do, it's always a challenge to see what you can create, you know? So living in the big city, do you have your own garden? Do you have the own personal space to do that? My garden is <laughs> filled with all the stuff that I use for work. So like leftovers, you know, <laughs> pottery, you know, whatever. It's all back right. there. Yeah. So so no, I have no. When I come home, I just want to take a shower, cook, eat, hang out with my family, <laughs> read and, you know, go to bed. Call my mom and <laughs> go to bed. <laughs> Do you uh, challenge yourself creatively? Um, create creatively. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's my flu medication. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, like the the garden that I'm doing in Kenya, um, because I'm using purely Kenyan native species and what might be considered Kenyan weeds. Mm -hmm. Um, that is a challenge for me. And it's also a challenge because the client is very used to a certain type of ornamental garden. So it's convincing the client that I'm, well, I mean, the client's already on board pretty much. Um, it's going to be a challenge to convince them that this is actually a garden that you will want to have photographed because their idea of a garden is like roses, you know, and, and all these <laughs> Sunflowers, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you go to bed at night, do you dream in the state of gardens? When I go to bed at night, I actually dream of the ocean. Really? I love, I love the ocean. You know, I spent a lot of time in the ocean when I was in college. I, I lived in a country where I, you know, every weekend I, I, I went to school in the city in that country. But, you know, an hour and a half out, I was at the ocean, you know, every Friday and we didn't come back till I, I went to college in Costa Rica and we didn't come back. You know, my my roommate and I didn't come back till like late Sunday evening, <laughs> you know, so, you know, and then I spent a lot of time, you know, in the ocean in Kenya. So I dream about the ocean. I live on Staten Island, you know, uh. you know, we got the ocean over here. You know, <laughs> even though I, I don't swim in it. No. <laughs> <laughs> in, in New York waters, but I dream about the ocean. I'm an I'm a water girl. I'm an ocean girl. I'm not even a lake girl. I'm an ocean girl. Costa Rica is a beautiful place, very lush, yeah, natural, yeah. God's earth uh, of gardens. Yeah. When you think of gardens in an essence, besides the one in your head for uh, teenagers, is there a vision that constitutes the perfect garden? Given that. It, Unspoiled nature. Unspoiled yeah. nature is the perfect garden. She ordered it the way that is best for us. You know, it's not just best for us, but it's best for animals. It's best for plants, you know, and that's why we love to go hiking. That's why we love to walk out into the desert. Um, early this year, I was out in California and I, you know, I was out in um, the desert in, um, in uh, what's that place? Where, where was I? The Lucerne Valley. Okay. And I was just like, oh my God, this looks just like home. You know, the landscape looked just like home. And nature is the best garden because she's ordered it in a way that is perfect for us, for our evolution, you know, for our mental well-being, you know, for, for everything. So nature. It's, I, I love to just go out into nature. And even more and more, you know, I was saying this to a friend of mine in the UK. I was telling him, I said, you know, I don't really know what I'm what I want to do with this work anymore. I mean, I get it that I can make these gardens, you know, like for a botanical garden or these spaces that are purely commercial where people come in, you know, have their experience and leave, but I don't know, you know, I'm really thinking about what this looks like moving forward for me. Mm -hmm. You know, because I know that nature is the perfect designer. I agree. I agree completely.
Mm-hmm. Being uh, in New York City, one of the major urban environments in the world, do mm-hmm. you see the trend of being green, green environments more and oh, more? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like we say, it's a trend. You know, it's it's you know, it's a trend, and a lot of people want to feel like they are doing good. Mm-hmm. You know, and they are regreening the earth, and it's very commendable. I think, though that more and more people outside of the West, more indigenous people um, need to be consulted, you know, because an indigenous, by indigenous, I mean indigenous Americans, Africans who are indigenous, I mean, we are indigenous, we are mm-hmm. African, you know, um, indigenous people in South America, indigenous people in Asia, these, in the Middle East, these people need to be consulted because very often our understanding of what needs to happen to to landscapes is very different from what the dominant narrative, you know, the dominant Western narrative mm-hmm. thinks should happen, you know. So, so I would like to see our voices heard, you know. I would like to hear more from people you know, some lady in in a in a in a little town in India. What does she think? You know, that's what I want to. That's the voice I want to hear. How do we do that? How do we get their voices more heard? By getting them on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> and having is that you a plug for me or you? <laughs> you. <laughs> for me and you. <laughs> you know. That, that's what we need to do. I mean, we've had enough. You know, I was watching something yesterday on Netflix, and I was like, man, I'm so tired of this. I want to see something different. I want to hear those voices. Mm-hmm. I, I really want to. And um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky that I have a lot of friends who do this kind of work in other countries. So I'm constantly listening to what they're saying, talking with them about, you know, what they're planting, how they are restructuring their gardens, how they are thinking about the work they do where they live, you know, in South America, in, you know, in Japan, in India. You know, I I really want more of that because that is what will save this planet. It is the people who were, quote unquote, left behind who will save this planet. True, true. Yeah. Is there a particular place you want to work that you haven't yet? Um, Japan. Yeah? Yeah. I'd How's... really like to go to Japan and do something, something, whatever it is. Like, I could I could do an in-house plant installation. I just <laughs> want to go to Japan. <laughs> I'd love to go to Japan. Yeah. What else would you like to achieve in your, this journey of yours? I would like to build a set for Disney. I would like to build a set for um, some anime slash something movie. You know, I love that. Just, I, I, you know, I'd love to do that. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do any mentoring, given that your thought and your process and how you're trying to educate others? Well, I, I co-founded a group called the BIPOC Court Group a couple of years ago. I'm not, I haven't been very active in it just because I've been so busy. And, you know, other people are part of it now and they do a lot. But I did a lot of mentoring there and just trying to help people um, with their, their, their optic and, you know, their career moves. What I have found, though, is that sometimes it's easier to listen than it is to give advice or to mentor. Because everybody comes with a story that's leading them somewhere. And you have to be able to step back and look at their, what I call their source code. Right. You know, listen to their source code and kind of see where that algorithm is headed. And if that... because you can tell people do this, do this, do this, and I think you should do this, and I think you should make these moves, but that source code is 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 the real driver. Mm-hmm. So I've learned to listen more to people and ask them what it is they 
think they want to do in the world? What are, what are they, where do you see yourself 15 years from now? You know, and they say, oh, well, I see myself as, you know, the president of, you know, this botanical garden in Nova Scotia. I, well, then how do you get there? You know, what are the moves you need to make? Mm-hmm. As opposed to me saying, well, here's what you need to do, because I think you would be best in this kind of job or, you know, oh, I know this guy and let me introduce you to this guy. So I stopped doing all that. Now it's more like, where do you see yourself? What 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 do you feel like you want to do? And then, oh, okay, that's what you want to do. Well, how do how do how do you get there? You know. And then, so, and then it works better that way. So, what advice would you give to somebody that lives in New York City or San Francisco or LA and only has about a twenty by twenty space? Well, the first thing I would say to them is understand first and foremost that the original landowner here wants their land back, you know. And if you can find um, peace with that, that'll open you up to to so much. You know, I, I come from East Africa. I come from a landscape that has always been my home and my ancestral home and all my ancestors are buried there. When I came here, I came here with an understanding that in as much as I live in America, I'm married to an American, this is not my home, you know, and I'm very clear that in as much as my husband is a second generation, I think second or third generation Italian American, this is not his home. There's an original owner here, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you can come to peace with that, then it gives you pause when you start to think about how you're going to organize this landscape, you know, because this really is somebody else's home. So if you can, if, so I would say to that New Yorker, as non-intrusive as you can be, be that. Because then there is integrity in Mm -hmm. your work. You know, there's, there's layers upon layers upon layers of stuff that has happened here in New York. One of the really cool things that I did this summer was I went to, I've, I've been there before, but um, I took my daughter to the Smithsonian Museum of, of the American Indian here on, um, here, right in, in Wall Street. I mean, and it well, was so yeah. fascinating to see the history of this landscape called, you know, New York, mm-hmm. you know, even Wall Street where we were. So I think when you, when you approach a landscape with integrity, first acknowledging, you know, there's this whole thing that people do now, the acknowledging that I'm on such and such land or such and such land or that such, you know, it can become very just performative, you know, and my advice, and I've said this many times before, even in, you know, when I've, whenever I've lectured in other places is if you can First, just understand that this belongs to somebody else. This is somebody else's home and we are guests here. Then the work that we do should be about integrity and being as non-intrusive as possible. I love that you said that. I'm I'm Native American. I'm registered with two yeah. tribes. So uh, that's an important factor. <laughs> it's part of a lot yes, of conversations yes. lately. Yes, yes. I have a, one of my very dear brother. I mean, he's like, he's my brother, basically, Dave. He is Aqua Sassane from up here um, in the Hudson, you know, uh, Valley area. And we ha- talk about these, you know, we have these really deep conversations because, you know, my background, my family background was all about fighting for our land against, you know, the British colonialists. You know, the, my parents were in reservations. I mean, you know, boarding schools, all that. Right, that, right. that entire history, is it was like a template. His family went through it, I've, and you just match it up. Right. And it, it, it works, you know, perfectly. So I think that, you know, and I always tell people, and some people don't like to hear this, I always say when, when, when you have an oppressed group of people who are watching all these people walk back and forth and build empires on their land. They still want their land back. And it may not be five years. It may not be 10 years. It may be 500 years from now. They will get their land back. I always say that. Because the people who carry the soul of of the land 
will always be the owners of the land, regardless of what's going on, you know. So so we who don't carry the soul of this, um, you know, Turtle Island Mm -hmm. are here to be non-intrusive and supportive with integrity. Exactly. Yeah. I'm so uh, you just made me smile inside when you said Turtle Island because a lot of people don't know what that means, and you do. Well, <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm indigenous. I'm an indigenous. There you go. <laughs> where I come from, so I know what my world is called. So you got to know what you got to know where you are and where you walk, and you know. If you could be placed in the perfect garden for yourself for your own soul, what does that look like for you? Lots of trees um, where I sit, but a wide open expanse of unspoiled nature in front of me, a couple of fruit trees, my daughter playing around me, my mom sitting next to me, my husband by my side, and just nice weather and a little dog running around. And I'm <laughs> in the ocean. Somewhere in the ocean somewhere. <laughs> Get the water. The close by, yeah. Yes. What advice would you give to somebody that wants to be a landscape designer and get into this industry in this field? Think about why you're doing it. Um, what is your intention? Think about how you understand the landscape and how you see yourself and how you locate yourself in the landscape. Because if you see it as just moving objects around, then that's deadening. That's that's not about life. But if you see yourself as part of this beautiful landscape that you can enhance, you know, by promoting it, you know, promoting its its flourishing, you know, promoting the the awe that is it induces in people, mm-hmm. then you then then you then you will be successful. I think that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. That makes sense. Works right. Yeah. I understand yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That's all that matters. I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is there a um is there any public places that people can see your work and experience some of the environments you've created? Yeah, well not not public. Um, a lot of the stuff that I've done is private, but they will see the new the new uh, garden in, at the Lewis Quinta Botanical Garden in Richmond, and that will be fantastic. There might be one coming up soon. I I, I just haven't signed yet, but clo- more closer to home in New York. But you know, whenever that comes out, I'll, I'll be able. to. And when does the Richmond one completed? We break ground, I believe, next year. So. As fast as we can put those plants in the ground, <laughs> as fast as the contractors can accomplish it all, then then it'll come into fruition. Well, is there anything I else? Had, I just had my another meeting a couple of days ago, and I just saw an email come in with um, the final drawing. So there you go. Today, so it will happen. Give it a year. <laughs> it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen, and it'll be a good one. Is there anything else you'd like to share and tell us about? Before we wrap up, well, I'm very thankful to be talking to you, and um, I just think that that more than anything, you know, la- landscape design, landscape architecture, this whole world is really like blossoming now. You know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry now, and Susie and Mary, you know, want to get into landscape design. And if you're doing it in in America, in 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 North America, just be mindful. Be very mindful. Have it as your grounding, your foundation that this is somebody else's home, and that whatever you need to be doing, whatever you're doing, is not intrusive. Um, you you just know that it may go at any moment. Um, because this is the 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 people who carry the soul of this land have the final the have the first the second and the final say mm-hmm. in in how this landscape evolves they're just on pause right now yeah it seems like they're on pause but they're not on pause because even in this pause they are evolving with their landscape Very this true. is just this is just a moment of of you know that 
the, you know they're caught in it but they're evolving with it so we will be we'll be long gone and they'll still be <laughs> <laughs> yes well, I appreciate your time and I appreciate you coming on the show and telling your story. It's been a wonderful chat. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Cray. Thank you. I don't know how you found me, but thank you. <laughs> was, hey. Thank you for, for calling me and Absolutely. thank you for talking to me. And thank you for allowing me to give you my meandering thoughts. My pleasure. Thank well, you. again, thank you. And uh, we'll talk soon. We will. Thank you so much. Thank you.